I do have a little topic to uh, talk about. It's just an idea that has been rolling around in my mind. So I thought I would name the uh, satsang today, the science of consciousness to see where that might, uh, that might take us into a, into an interesting direction. But of course, as always, this is satsang, which means it's an open dialogue between yourself and me. So you can ask any question you want about, about any subject. Um, don't be surprised if I take the most domestic subject and turn it into an existential discussion of your nature, because that's what satsang is all about, to always point you back to what you essentially are. Manx Mix, it's only nine o'clock in the UK, right? Very good. Um, Barbro is also in, somebody else from Sweden. We have two in Sweden tonight, but 10 o'clock in Sweden. Boo-hoo. <laughs> Sorry, Barbro. <laughs> finding, finding times for everybody around the world is not an easy, and not an easy task. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, satsang is, is an open forum to ask any questions. I do invite you to ponder the questions, though. You know, there may be a question behind your question. There may be something very uh, much more uh, under the surface that's actually prompting the question, because sometimes our, our minds want to make up questions to distract us. The, the mind is, is always hungry for more information. It is insatiable. The mind is a hungry ghost by nature. For those of you who don't know what a hungry ghost is, it's a beautiful image in, in Buddhism of a, uh, of a being that you can be, you know, a being that you can come back as, um, uh, that is, has an enormous appetite. So there's these beings with these big heads and big mouths and these big stomachs. They're just insatiable appetite, but their necks are thinner than a human hair. So not even a piece of rice, a piece of rice will choke them. And so it's just this beautiful image of the insatiable nature of the egoic mind. And I, 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 I want to encourage you to, to go beneath the mere desire for information uh, or for uh, you know, just getting new stuff, new interesting facts to, uh, to think about. And instead... Think about questions that, uh, that will basically lead you to the doorway of freedom. Freedom from the egoic mind. We don't want to free up the mind. We want to be free from it. We want it to stop calling the shots. And we call the shots instead. So with that in mind, uh, please just kind of let the, let the... What question is really on your heart about going free. What does it mean to go free? Well, the reason I decided I wanted to talk today about uh, the science of consciousness, I was, I was thinking about, about it and how, you know, I'm doing a class on, um, uh, hello, Pam from Norfolk, UK. Hi, Pam. Uh, I'm doing a class on manifestation. And even in a class dedicated to manifesting stuff, making, bringing stuff into your lives, there is, uh, my intent is to take everyone beyond merely the desire for stuff, which is the hungry ghost, by the way, and into a, a burning interest and curiosity as to how things really work. How does the universe actually function? Who am I? What is consciousness? Because if you, if you have the answer to those questions, you are, <laughs> you are with, you are, you have gone beyond merely manifesting things in your life so that you'll feel better, you know, be more happy, have more, you know, have more things and have more freedom in life. And you'll step into a completely different level of freedom. Judy just made the comment that that manifestation class is off the charts. And I'm very happy with the way it's, the, the way it's coming. 
see, it isn't, it isn't about not getting the things that you want. You know, it, 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 we tend to see it as, you know, being materialistic. I have to get all these things I want and I want to manifest it. Or we have this other very narrow view of spirituality that it's somehow it's a renunciation of the world and I don't, it wouldn't anything and I should be happy without. And both of those, both of those are wrong. But what I'm really wanting people to experience, what I'm really wanting you all to, to, uh, to get a taste for is to become so curious about the way things really work that you forget about the rest of the stuff, that you really get turned on by the idea of understanding your own, your own nature. It's getting kind of warm in here, so I'm going I'm to take off this, uh, this, this jacket. Hopefully I won't, uh, I won't take off the microphone with it. Okay, good. Um, so, you know, consciousness is unique. Even, um, even really uh, honest, honest scientists who study all sorts of stuff recognize that consciousness is mysterious. There's an assumption that consciousness is a, is a product of the brain. But when you ask, you know, real, real physicists and people who, and real biologists, people who really study this, they, there's a qualitative difference between consciousness and every other experience. You take the entire human body apart and, and break it all down into its component pieces, and you cannot find consciousness. You cannot find an organ of consciousness. That is an organ that is obviously conscious. You cannot find the consciousness molecules or atoms, right? They don't exist. The best theory we can come up with is that consciousness mysteriously arises out of a particularly uh, complex and unusual set of circumstances where things just happen to be in just the right form and bing, consciousness appears. But the fact that something self-aware and sentient uh, emerges out of a, a whole bunch of particles, none of which are self-aware and sentient, is a great mystery. And I really want you to appreciate the, the, the wonder of this mystery. Because if you do, it will, it, it, any, if you really see it, you'll be, you will be completely dumbstruck. Hello, Cyrus from Utah. Remington is here with us. Uh, Sarah from France. Hi, Sarah. Um, Damper, why do we even exist? What is non-local awareness? How do I achieve it? Or is it just another power distraction? Interesting. I'll, I'll get to it. I'll get to this. Right. Let's focus our attention, just yourself, look at consciousness, the sense, the sense that you are consciously aware. Barbara says hello from Sandpoint, Idaho. Very wonderful. You're consciously aware. You are self-aware. Where does that come from? Just don't buy the idea that, oh, yeah, it's, the brain's going on and all sorts of stuff. Because if that's really the case, we can make an argument and many do, that our conscious awareness is an illusion. It is a combination of things of the senses and processing of the brain that makes us believe that we are conscious when in, when in fact we're just like a machine. A great deal like, imagine there was a, uh, uh, you know, many years in the future and we've got these incredibly lifelike robots. So lifelike, they actually learn you know, they really, you couldn't, you can't tell them apart, you know, perfect skin, perfect everything. You could not tell whether or not they were self-aware. You couldn't, there'd be nothing to indicate it. You couldn't reach down and find the self-awareness chip. You couldn't find the consciousness algorithm. And so there'd be this mystery. They exude uh, all of the qualities, uh, display all of all of the qualities of self-awareness, of sentience, are they sentient? And the same thing is asked of us as human beings. Are you sentient? You exude all of these qualities. Are, are you sentient? Or is this just 
the processing. Now, what I, I find really fascinating about this is when you look at it from the point of view of modern science, Western science, everything has to be defined by looking at its parts. That's classical analysis. It's 3,000 years old. The, the whole view that of the, the Western world about everything from religion to politics and economics and science is all you know something by breaking it down into its component parts. Well, we've broken it down. We have broken it down as far as we can go, and there's no sign of consciousness anywhere in that. Which means to me that perhaps we need a new science. That the classical approach to understanding something has failed here. I can't look at you any more than I could look at a robot and say they're sentient. I can't have, there's nothing outside, outside that I can point to for proof that there is sentient, that it, consciousness you know, even exists, which means there's only one place we can turn in. Exactly what the sages have been saying for millennia. If you want to know what the truth is, you have to turn within. We have to go to our own experience. See, because if classical analysis can't answer this question, we have to throw out classical analysis, which means all of human knowledge, all of science, all the authority that it holds, which is fine, you know, for aerodynamics and airplanes and how various parts of the body work and all that, fine, absolutely fine. I take it in, but for consciousness, I have to go somewhere else. I have to look somewhere else. And what I find absolutely amazing is the only place I can look is myself, my own experience of it. I experience being conscious, yet I cannot find any consciousness in any particular uh, structure. I cannot find consciousness in the brain any more than I can find the song in the wire you know, the, the electricity is running through the wire. There's a frequency running through the wire, but the wire isn't hearing a song. As far as the wire is concerned, there's no song going on. It, it has to get to me, to whatever it is that said, ah, and reacts to it and thinks it's wonderful and has, and has fun with it. I want you to become turned on by that because you, you, you realize that no one but you can answer that question. People say it, oh, it's the brain, it's functioning in the brain, but it's like, okay, show me. Show me the organ of consciousness. You know, the brain is very fascinating. We have the experience, every one of us has the experience of there be kind of this central place in which everything is being processed, right? Everything kind of comes into this place and I make choices and all that kind of stuff, the sense of I and everything. There is no such place in, in the brain. Different parts react to different things. Your eyes react to one thing. There is no center of the brain that's the central th through which things are, different parts are making different decisions about some. So this sense of being an individual self-aware entity isn't in the brain. It's not how it functions. So where are you in all of that? Now, if this isn't really captured you and gotten you interesting, you're not hearing me, <laughs> right? It, it means that you and you alone are the only authority that can answer the biggest question ever, the biggest inquiry in the human kingdom, which is the nature of consciousness which is the nature of myself, the nature of whatever it is that's having the experience of life. This is, <laughs> I, 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 I hope this is, my, my, my mission here was to kind of wipe out all the authority that, it, that is claimed externally to tell you how the, all of this works and show you that all, the, the whole standard by which those conclusions are drawn don't apply when you're talking about consciousness. It is qualitatively different. You cannot simply say, yeah, well, it's, 
you know, it's a, an emergent property of the complexity of matter, which is the answer they give. They it, can't tell. You can't, you can't say it. You cannot really say it. And no serious scientist would. There's just, I don't know. I don't know. It's different. Now, most scientists aren't able to step out of the materialistic classical model in order to consider an alternative. There are some that, that do. There's a biologist I know of, his name escapes me now, who, uh, who's done some papers on self-organizing systems, who's also, who's also a, a Zen student for 25 years, and he has. He and another fellow are actually producing a paper saying, it's different. Our science of consciousness cannot be classical analysis. This is, this is earth shattering, folks. This represents a completely new step in human growth and awareness and, and um, endeavor. So I just wanted to talk about that for a little bit to see what questions that might, that might bring up for you. If that might kind of sp uh, stir the pot a little bit so that you might begin to examine that. Because everything I teach, whether I'm teaching about the chakras or I'm teaching about reincarnation or I'm teaching EFT and energy healing, if I'm teaching the way the nervous system works, all of it is an approximation. It's a reduction because the real, the, the real truth is discovered in this question of who am I? Who is it? What is it? What is the nature? of whatever it is that's hearing my words right now. You know, the brain, the ears are not hearing it. This microphone doesn't hear me. <laughs> you know, your, the speakers or the earphones you have in your head, they're not hearing me. You know, the screen that you're looking at me on is not seeing me. Your eyes, you can take your eyes. They can't see. They've processed stuff. There's nothing there that's actually seeing. Something is, though. Something's hearing, something's seeing, something's experiencing. Whatever that is, I call that consciousness, conscious awareness. But whatever that is, it's who you really are. Now, to me, that is undoubtedly the most important question a human being can ask. Jill says, scientists are funny. <laughs> they seem to think they can study something that's not part of the material world by studying the material world. Well, yes, that's absolutely true. There's and this is with all due respect to, to, to science and the wonders, the incredible innovations that have been brought about. But we obviously need a better model for humanity. Otherwise, the very same scientific discoveries will basically destroy us and maybe take the earth with us, with it. Uh, but you see, they, they don't believe there's anything other than the material world. So they, they won't consider many some do, won't consider the possibility that consciousness is not material, that there is an entirely different level of conscious existence that is not material, is not made of matter, is not made of fundamental particles, but actually exists independently of all of those. That's big. Uh, Monica says, I am convinced to have... I am convinced to have recognized my true reality, universal consciousness, the only reality. My question for you, GP, is how do you know that what you really are, the, the same that I am, will never end? That's a really great question, Monica. Because if we give that, if we look at that question from the point of view of the mind and time, it becomes unanswerable. You cannot answer it. If, as far as did I exist before I was born, I don't remember. You know, people could say, well, I, I remember past lives. But there's no concrete, objective way you can verify your existence prior to birth. Can't do it. Same thing as after death. So what we have to look at is we can't use those. I mean, if you ended at death, you wouldn't know it, right? Because <laughs> it, it, if it end, if it stops sometime, maybe not this death, or maybe you go through 500 lifetimes and then it ends. 
you'll never, you won't be able to answer that question because the answer would be, you wouldn't be there anymore. And the, the question you, everything would be gone. So you cannot answer that question through any of the means by which we've normally tried to do that. So instead, we have to look at it. We have to look directly at our experience of it. The experience, you've recognized your true reality as universal consciousness. Now just feel that consciousness and then just look at your life. Right now, you are aware and you are aware of being aware. You're aware of my words, you're aware of me, you're aware of your experience. Everything I'm saying, the words are flowing out over time. They're constantly changing. But the hearing of the words, the receiving of the words, the consciousness of, that is receiving those words, has that changed? What is known is changing constantly. The knowing itself has remained absolutely the same. Look at your life. Go all the way back as far as you can remember. Was the knowing ever different? Move deep, increasingly deep. Move your sense of I, who I am, out of the body and into that knowing. The body, its senses, the sensations, and all the body is, is our experience of thought, emotion, and sensation. That's all it is. We know nothing other than that. If it weren't for that, body would have, have absolutely no meaning. And frankly, we don't even know for sure if the body exists. We do know that there is thought, there is feeling, and there is sensation. That we do know. We don't really know if there's a body out there that is generating that experience or if it's being completely generated from within. We don't know if everything we're experiencing right now isn't a big dream. There's absolutely no way to validate the legitimate objective uh, uh, nature of what is being experienced. But one thing is absolutely self-evident and certain, and that is you are experiencing. Whoever you are, whatever you are, that which is experiencing must be it. It stops there. What, that is the only thing that is entitled to the, to the name I. Now, just settle into that sense of being and see if you can find an end to it. Now remember, even time is simply an idea. It's a concept that we've applied. We say time, but what we actually mean is time is a word to express the fact that things are constantly changing. And when we measure the differences in the change, we call it time. If it was like this then, and it's not like this, and now it's like this. And we call that time. And notice that what it was, all the changes and what it became, and even goes out of existence, was witnessed by something. Is that something itself in time? Because if it's not changing, then it's not in time. I need to shut the door here real quick. Uh, one second. To knock stuff over. As you can tell, I'm in a different location. I'm at my son's house in Seattle. So that sense of being is the only place where the answer to that question will come from. Am I timeless, beginningless, and endless? And just sense into it intuitively. Did that you have a beginning. Can you find it? 
will it have an end? If you give that to your mind and you try to think of it in terms of time, you'll find you can't answer the question because <laughs> you can't know. You won't know until you get there, right? If you are simply, but when you look at the, at the experiencing itself, the knowing itself, you see that it has never changed. From there, you have a pretty good indicator that it didn't have a beginning. It's not going to have an end. But most importantly, just keep bringing the sense of I back there. I am convinced to have recognized my true reality. Who is the I that recognized the true reality? Was there a you that recognized it? In which case, are there two? Is there you and reality, true reality? Or did true reality simply recognize itself? And you, what you thought yourself to be, poof, disappeared. That idea you hold of yourself vanished. Muji makes a beautiful statement about uh, about uh, non-dual inquiry he said he said the one who starts the inquiry does not finish the inquiry but is finished by the inquiry the reality recognizes itself there's not a person who recognizes their true nature True nature awakens to itself. That's what the word Buddha means. That's what he was, when he was first asked, who, who are you? And somebody saw this glowing being and he said, I am the Buddha, the awakened one. Not one who has awakened, but the one who has awakened. The awakened one, the awakened only. God realizing she's God. Oh, <laughs> that's who I am. The more the eye goes there, the less it goes out there, the more aware of its own timelessness that it is. And that question just kind of vanishes. Does that help you, Monica? Beautiful, beautiful question. Thank you for that. I love those. I love those kinds of questions. Remington says, uh, yes, I forget. Yes, I will, man. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not forgetting you. Thank you, GP. Very helpful. Good, 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 good. Um, Jill, if I, where are you? There you are. Remington, why do we even exist? What is non-local awareness? How do I achieve it? Or is it just another two different lines of thought there? Why do we even exist? What if there wasn't a reason? What if there was no cause to you existing? Just kind of picking up where I was with Monica. If, if your being is truly timeless, then the question, why do I exist, ceases to, to matter, right? I mean, it, the question is only valid if I didn't, and then I came into existence, I could ask, well, why did I come into existence? But if I have always been, then the question just vanishes. Why? There is no why. Nothing caused it. <laughs> when we ask why, it's like, why, what made, what string of events made this happen? But if this just was, nothing made it happen. So there is no why. It just is why do we exist? <laughs> There's two questions there. Why? Which is, you know, what's all the things that made it happen? And of course, you can't answer it, and it wouldn't even apply in that case. And the other question is, do we exist? The answer is yes, <laughs> you do. Go to that sense of existence and see if the question even matters. You cannot ask that question unless you think of yourself as a form 
that was born at a certain time and is having a life. If you are not the form that was born, but you are the timeless consciousness that simply witnessed a form appearing, you wouldn't even, why do I exist? I just exist. I just am. Now your next question is, what is non-local awareness? Um, Let me ask you a simple question. Here's a good, here's an answer. If we're right now, if I say, if I talk about here and there, you and I, you know, you're all by yourself. So you're sitting somewhere, and you know, you call me up and say, "Hey, gee, let's have a, you know, let's have a, let's have a cappuccino together." Right? Why don't you over there come here? Right? And say, so, "Okay, so I come there." Right? And so now. You and I are sitting together. At that moment, you have another friend that you'd like to get in on a conversation. Right? Now, at, at that moment, am I here or am I there? I mean, I'm sitting across the table from you. Right? So now the here is a little bigger, isn't it? it? So you'd say, hey, come here to somebody. Maybe you see somebody walk by and say, hey, come here. Right? Am I in this here now? So that here just got bigger, didn't it? And if somebody called you up and say, uh, where, at, or where are you at? And you give them the name of the coffee shop we're at. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here, man. Come on, come on down. I'm here. You're talking about the shopping, the, 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 the um, coffee shop. Oh, and it's in this shopping center. Right? And so now here is the shopping center, isn't it? And if you got a, a call from a friend from overseas, right? Where are you at? Oh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in New York, in, in the U.S., Right? And now here is New York. <laughs> you see that here means nothing. So when we talk about non-local awareness, like it's this magical thing, it's simply when you realize that here and there are completely arbitrary and made up and have no absolute meaning. They mean whatever they want them to mean. For most people here simply means this body but then you make it into a family you make it a house you make a community you make it to and if we we're communicating to somebody on a planet in another solar system here would be the solar system another galaxy here would be the milky way there there's no absolute boundary it is all perceptual and so now it's not a so that's a much better avenue to explore what where is here than looking at like non-local awareness as like some kind of uh, special esoteric uh, gift or practice or something you can you, you you can use then it would be a distraction because now you're trying to create some kind of uh, altered consciousness instead of asking the deepest question which is okay if if here and there are completely relative, then there is no here or there. There's no boundaries whatsoever. Where is the boundary of consciousness? Can you find a place that, can you find some place outside of consciousness? The moment you do, it's in consciousness. Con you, you, when you really look, you cannot find a boundary to consciousness. No matter how big it gets, it's, it's like space. No matter how big it gets, it's, it's like there's space already there waiting for it. So your ideas get bigger. No matter how big they get, it's like something's even bigger is containing them. So does that answer your question there, Remington? Um, you had another one there. To have a beginning, you would have to have had to seen it not exist. To have seen it not exist means you were there to see it right prior to birth it had been nothing suddenly there's something and then there's nothing again that's the only way it could be if you could say that something came into existence yes you would have had to been there in order to see it come into existence which means you're still there this is i hope i'm opening you up to realize that this kind of an exploration cannot cannot be solved in the, with the mind because the mind is dualistic by nature the mind 
has to manipulate objects. So it cannot imagine consciousness. It can't has no model, no visual for consciousness because uh, because it's formless. <laughs> it cannot conceive anything that is formless. How can you? Try, and you realize you can't do it. So it, it, it assumes we have this deeply powerful assumption that we are the form and therefore we came into existence. And most people argue till the cars come home that that's the case. You came into existence, whether it would be through evolution or through, you know, the star beings planting, you know, genetic seeds, whether it be God that said, let there be people walking around. Um, you came into existence. The, the mind will, will, will fight tooth and nail to hold on to that because the alternative is it is non-physical it is non it's not a form and and the key to awakening is is going beyond the attachment to form real liberation is when you are liberated from the attachment to to being a form any form at all and you see that you're not consciousness is not a form it has no age it has no location it has no gender it has no beliefs it has no preferences it has no uh anything it just is poppy says hello poppy qp love you <laughs> glad to see you again yes love you too uh remington oh remington you got lots of questions today when you are impeded or maybe free, why do people seem to suddenly appear? Why do people appear randomly? I'm not, when you are impeded or free, why do people seem to appear, suddenly appear? I, I'm not exactly sure what your um, question is, Remington. Can you re can rephrase it, please? Um, I'm not sh quite sure what you're getting at. Um, so I think I've got all the questions there. How are people, uh, how are you taking this? How are you feeling about everything that I'm, I'm sharing with you right now? Because to me, it's, it's the most important inquiry in the human kingdom. <laughs> simple, simple as, simple as that. I, I mean, it's a big statement, isn't it? But I believe it is the most important thing that any human being can ponder. Andre says hi. Uh, hi, Andre. Soren says, thank you. This is nice. Very good. Okay. Okay. Is it opening you? Is it inspiring you? Do you feel lighter? Do you feel freer? Is there something inside that's kind of churning? I mean, this is a revolutionary idea that you are not the body. You are consciousness. And the consciousness doesn't derive itself from the body. Consciousness is not dependent upon the body. Conscious is not a, a, a function of the body. Consciousness is not a function of the brain. A very good friend of mine has just, uh, has just published a book on how the brain creates, creates the universe. And the question I asked is, what created the brain then? I mean, the brain is part of this universe that we're looking at. I mean, people want some physical touchstone. They can even get the whole idea like the matrix or something, right? They get the idea of the holographic universe that we're generating this whole thing in our minds, but they have to have something that can hold on to. So it becomes the brain. You are not the brain. You're not in the brain. You have nothing. The brain is just another picture in consciousness. And I can say that with confidence because... To me, it's self-evident, and I'm inviting everybody to look in the in the same in the same place. There is no evidence, not a shred, that a that brain that these unintelligent, unaware, unsentient particles can create the the wonder of self-aware consciousness. Um. Remington says, it seems like sometimes that people appear from nowhere. 
Of course, they've existed, and we're not just in your awareness. It is strange, though. Well, <clears throat> not really. Really, I mean, when you're talking about awareness is infinite, it has no, it has no limits, right? People pop in, in and out of it all the time. Our perception is limited. Our perception is like this. Our, the focus of our attention is smaller. And so people are going to pop in and out of that from this perspective. From the perspective of awareness, nobody pops in and out of anywhere. And our perception is guided by our beliefs and our interests and our focus of attention. So that if my attention is focused here, there could be all sorts of stuff going on over here and I simply don't see it. Not that it isn't there, but I don't see it because my attention has been narrowly focused. I mean, magicians use this trick all the time to distract you, get your attention over here. They do something over here in plain sight, <laughs> if, if you were to look, but they know how to guide your attention so perfectly that you don't see them do, you know, they don't, you don't see them move the thing over and then they say, look, it disappeared. It's just, it's the way it works. But that focus of attention is not awareness. Awareness is bigger than that. Awareness is outside of what the mind can conceive. Uh, focus of attention is something that comes and goes within awareness. And you can get a sense of that because you know, all of a sudden you'll notice, oh, my attention has wandered. Well, what noticed it wandering? Something bigger than even your attention noticed attention had changed which means there's something else consciousness is something else altogether it is not just the focus of attention um sophie says hi gp did you see my question hold on let me look let me let me go back sophie i i'm not seeing it uh, remington barbara Monica, Puppy, Remington, Andre, Remington. No, I didn't. So why don't you ask it again? So if I'm, I'm tired, I just scrolled all the way back and I can't, uh, and I can't, and I can't find it. So if you'd uh, be so kind as to post it again, I would love to, uh, I'd love to answer it. Andre, Siparu, where are you, Andre? Tell me where you're located. Sophie, where are you located too? Um, I'd love to know where people are. Andre asks, how can I dissolve the tension called ego or the sense of separation in the body? Um, well, the easiest way is to come to realize that you're not the body. If, if you recognize that you are not the body, but the body is some, simply something you're having an experience of, you won't care whether you resolve the tension or not. The ten you can just be present with it. And there's a wonderful thing that happens. I don't want that to sound cavalier. Because when I teach inner reconciliation as a spiritual path and as a therapeutic path, I bring people to a place I call the yoga of allowing, this place of just allowing things to be. When you know that you are consciousness, you are, you are not concerned about what consciousness is experiencing. It's not that you don't care, it's that you don't mind. There's a neutrality, an equanimity. You can call it compassion, you can call it love. So that instead of how do I get rid of this tension in the body, I become curious as to why there is tension in the body, because you're compassionate with the body, not because you need to get rid of it, because you see that consciousness has no preference. It doesn't care whether it's there or not. Consciousness is completely unaffected by what it experiences. Is, is the screen on your TV the least bit affected er, on your computer here? Is it the least bit affected by what I'm doing here? <laughs> no matter what I do. If I was to, if I, if I was, if I was to suddenly, uh, this room filled with water or burnt down, would your screen be the least bit affected? If the sun exploded and took the entire solar system with it, would the space that it's in be affected by it? To get to this place of just being neutral, and I do it through inner reconciliation. You don't have to have the full revelation of being pure consciousness. You can find that you can get to this place where you can simply allow the body to feel whatever it's feeling. 
and you can be totally neutral about it. And what happens then is that the, your resistance to it, your, which is your desire to get rid of it, which is the egoic mind. The egoic mind wants to get rid of it. You don't really care. In this place, I call it the place of the peacemaker, you simply let it be there and it becomes very compassionate. And suddenly this tension, which is no longer, you're no longer fighting, can either you know, move out of the body, move through the body, do whatever it needs to do and go, or reveal its story to you. It can be some old trauma, some pattern, some lots of things that it could be. But as long as our number one goal is to get rid of it, it's going to be digging in its heels because, you know, I mean, how do you feel if somebody wants to get rid of you? <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. Reestablishing this relationship with the, the body, with the feelings, with the thoughts, with the sensations and all of that from this wonderfully beautiful neutral place um, is the only, to me, the only genuine form of healing. And that's what inner reconciliation is. That's what it's all about is, many people on this list can, can attest to. And ultimately, it will lead you to see that you are that pure consciousness. And nothing other than that, which means nothing that happens out here can perturb you. Nothing can disturb you. Nothing can touch you. How can it? Like, it can't touch space. Um, how is that, Andre? Does that help you? Um, is all dissension called ego? So the ego is the resistance. It's an, you can say the functioning of resistance, which is our identification with a position, right, is the ego. The moment I let go of my position, I let go of, I, of the, I allow that sense of separation in the body to be there. I am no longer its slave. I am the master. And I don't care if it's there or not. I can now welcome it lovingly and love is what heals <laughs> simple as that love is what heals soren says if i realize that i am consciousness will experience will i experience the world differently will i be able to maintain the new perspective indefinitely this is, all, this is another really good question i'm very happy with the level of the questions today very happy indeed um if i realize that i am consciousness first off You are consciousness. What I want you to feel is that I want to know the truth and I don't care otherwise. I don't care what the ramifications are. I don't care if I experience the world differently or not. I don't care if I maintain it or not. I want to know who I actually am. <laughs> am I consciousness or not? I want this solved. I don't want this to be some philosophical thing that goes on for the rest of my life. God damn it. Am I or am I not? And what do I need to do to find out? If the question is important enough, that's the kind of, that's the kind of energy you put, you put into it. So start with that. Then you won't care. Will you experience the world differently? Absolutely you will. Because you will experience the world without a story. Instead of identifying as this limited, finite person that's trying to get stuff from the world, you are this, in, instead, you are the infinite consciousness that needs nothing from the world. You have shifted the relationship with everything 180 degrees. So now everything is not about what you can get, but what you can give. It's no longer about acquiring, it's about loving. <laughs> it, it's, it's no longer uh, about getting, getting stuff, it's about creative expression. So... Will this be different? Will this bowl with the spoon in it be any? Will it be different? Will it suddenly look like a, a you know a cow or a spaceship? No, it'll still be this, but there's no story about it anymore. You won't see it as being this fixed thing. You'll see it as being this wonderful play play of consciousness, an object in consciousness, something that is that is innate to consciousness. Oops, sorry about that. Only. And so the world will be exactly the same and absolutely nothing will be the same. That's the best way that I, that I can put it. The, the world will not appear any different, but you will ha be living in a completely different world. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Will I be able to maintain the new perspective indefinitely? Eventually. The more you see that it's who you are, 
you'll see that the perspectives come and go, but the consciousness that is aware of the perspective never changes. When that really dawns, it's permanent. The aperture opens and never closes. As long as you believe that it is a state you arrive at, you've created a you and this ideal enlightened state, you are different. And now this becomes something you have to try to maintain. Nobody can do that. So now it becomes an aspect of consciousness, some kind of you know, quality, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel enlightened, I'm going to be happy all the time, instead of just, I am aware all the time. I am never not aware. I am never not conscious, even if I'm conscious of nothing, right? If there's nothing there, which others would call unconscious, you are still conscious of nothing. And so consciousness is always conscious. What we do in our spiritual pursuits, and it's been taught this way uh, a, a, a lot, so people misunder misunderstand it, is that somehow awakening is this super state, this super consciousness, this super duper consciousness, on and on and on, levels of dimensions and all of that kind of stuff, ex instead of the simple awareness that is absolutely ordinary and every day. So we're looking for extraordinary experiences instead of the experiencing itself in, bef in front of which all experience takes place. We don't, we don't care anymore about what is being experienced. All the attention is, oh my God, I'm experiencing. That never changes. It's infinite. It's eternal. It is boundless. It has no end, has no beginning. It has no gender. It has no age. It has no form. It has no location. You, all of that is experienced. The experiencing itself, changeless. Does that answer your question, uh, uh, um, Soren? Soren, got it. Soren Bag Bagley. Um, Chrissy, hello, Chrissy. Everything, every question is subsumed by consciousness. I am that. This is deepening. Beautiful, beautiful, and I've known you for a while now. I know it. I know how what that means and what that means to you, Marlene. Hello, Marlene. A um, bit of a lot of things. Oh wow, hmm, confusion. That explains a lot. But but wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it at that. If you want to translate, that's fine. But I I I it ends in a wow, so I'm I'm good. So if it's like uh, it's just like something clicks and you you don't know what how to say it love it we'll leave we'll leave it at that um kyle hello kyle is it possible to become aware enough to be completely free of thought um awareness is free of thought do it right now right now see again we're thinking that awakening is i don't have any thoughts Awakening is recognizing that you are the one experiencing thoughts, and now it doesn't matter if thoughts are there or not. It is not about the presence or absence of thought. They indicate nothing. Sometimes there can be an enormous amount of thought, sometimes none. That's a huge mistake. Uh, and people practice various kinds of meditation techniques to get into samadhi, which is this, this state of utter, of utter of no thought. And a lot of people say that that's kind of the ultimate of meditation is the, you know, the quiet mind, no thought. Well, it's not hard to get to the quiet mind, right? But no, not even Buddha could maintain it. And even the, even the most advanced yogi, I don't, they go in there for months. Eventually, thought's going to arise. <laughs> I really got to pee. I mean, something, right? <laughs> Something's going to happen. So... You say, you say, I've experienced this once during meditation. I could hear my thoughts, but I could finally see I wasn't my thoughts. That's it. That's all. You don't worry about whether they're there or not. You're not them. They can come and go. They're part of the universe. They're, they're part of everything. I mean, it's, it's kind of like saying, I want the wind to stop. I want the sun to stop shining. Do I need to be free of rain? Right? Thought, emotion, sensation are life. This is how everything is. The problem isn't with any of those. The problem is that we've identified with those. So I think I am my thoughts. I think I am 
my feelings. I think I am my sensations. I think I am my memories, my associations, my past, my all of my lives, my traumas, my gender. I think I am all of those things instead of just seeing them as thoughts. And thoughts come and go, do they not? You are obviously not a thought <laughs> because thoughts don't think themselves and you're watching them come and go. So what are you? What is it that's watching them come and go? So now you can drop forever the thought that you need to be free of thought. <laughs> it is just a, a mistaken spiritual teaching that um, I'm, I'm here to correct. It's not so. You don't need to be free of thought. I'm never, I'm not free of thought. Not never. I mean, sometimes, yeah. I'm going to meditation. And there'll be, you know, but I don't care. <laughs> It's like, okay. And sometimes the thoughts are brilliant and sometimes they're like really annoying, right? It's like, what? Where did that come from? Sometimes, you know, thoughts will come from anywhere. Sometimes they're utterly laughable. Sometimes they'll have an, an emotional reaction to them. You know, somebody in memory will go, ooh, right? So what? <laughs> I'm alive. That's what's going to happen. As long as there's a body, <laughs> it's going to happen. So the, the, the object in a real object of meditation is to become aware of you being aware right? and realize that that's who I am. And then none of this matters anymore. The feelings don't matter, but it's more than they just don't, don't, don't matter. You, you don't mind them. And the, the beautiful thing about that is that when that is seen, you actually can be, you become a healer. You become open. You become capable of creating a space that allows all of the, the psychological distortions and stuff that's been bugging us and constricting our lives to come to the surface, surface and dissolve because you're not trying to push it away anymore. You're welcoming it. You're just this huge open heart of love. Uh, so does that answer the question for you, Kyle? Andre is from Romania. Hi. Great, man. Great, thank you, thank you. There's a message held for review. Somebody wrote some, well, oh, hold on. Let me show it, that's interesting. It's interesting how they how they do that. Um, I only just says Germany, I don't know why it's being held. Um, uh, Grundelgenda, Grundelgenda? Did I say that right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, do, uh, I do often butcher these. Uh, these foreign names. Um, Manx Mix says, oh, Sophie, there, there we are. Sophie, Sophie says, hi, oh, I'm in London. Is it that simple to stop telling story about experience so to allow what is happening without my judgment overlaid on top? Is that freedom? Thank you. Thank you for putting it up there again, Sophie, and I will get back to you, Manx Mix. Um, uh, is it simple? Uh, well, e e e yes and no. I, I mean, um, e I mean, in principle, it is obviously. It's just if you recognize that it's a story, but um, you know, even after I ex experienced uh, 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 awakening, I there was I was just I, there was an enormous amount of energy and momentum and habit in the nervous system that I simply did not understand. So I'd question what I was seeing. I'd question, I mean, it was just, it was really quite, quite brutal. Um, so there is a, a habit, there's a flow. There is, there's a momentum behind our beliefs and the, you know, the storyteller is a, is an integral part of human life. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's, 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 it's part of, uh, it's part of what we do that, the human mind just does not like having a void, so it makes stuff up, right? And, and that's just, that's the way it works. Coming to see that that's what it is, and then consistently doing that begins to break the yoke of it. And that's what inner reconciliation training is all about. It brings you to that place where you can really let it happen. You can be totally present with it, and it doesn't throw you off base. You're not afraid of it anymore. You're not intimidated by it anymore. So you can begin to really uh, settle into seeing that it is all a story and that you are beyond that story. And you can even go beyond creating better stories, which is what a lot of uh, positive psychology is about, which is good. 
you know, better to have a good story about you than, than a horrible one, you know, better to be, have a, a functional story than a dysfunctional story and better to have a well-behaved ego than a misbehaving ego. Um, but they're, they're not the truth of being, right? Until you see through all stories and get, and that I sinks deeply into the consciousness that's aware of all stories. Now you can move freely through all perspectives. You know, when you have to be hard and make tough decisions, you do. When you're just soft, soft as satin, you are. You, you are now free to be completely present in every moment without, without bringing in memories, a past, or an agenda. And that makes you move through the world with an equanimity that is just, that is just um, extraordinary. I uh, hope that answers it for you, Sophie. If not, you will tell me. Kyle says, thank you. Andre says, hi again, San. Um, mix, mix. Let's see. Back to you. In a dream, there was me keen to understand some text. As I woke, it was obvious the text was just being made up for me who was believed to be real. <laughs> and this... And that this happens all the time. It was a shock. Um, yes, yes, it is a shock, isn't it? Because we are so convinced that this me is who we are, uh, that we don't even bother questioning it. And when we do, we start getting a little bit nervous. Well, if I'm not that, then, then what am I? We start looking for something else that I can say, that's it. Um, and that's where it takes some courage, some, some boldness, and, and frankly, some, uh, some exposure to a teacher because it's really hard to get through that on your own. <clears throat> In a dream, there was me keen to understand some text. As I awoke, it was obvious that the text was just being made up for a me who was believed to be real, correct. The sense of me um, was arising in response to the text reacting to the text, preferring this text over that text, this over that. If we realize that life is happening, right? We don't need to stop life. We don't need to stop thoughts. We don't need to stop the rain. We don't need to do any of that kind of stuff. All we need, all we need to do is to, is to know who it is that's actually experiencing the rain and the clouds and the thoughts and the feelings. And then you'll notice that there's a mechanism in place. A particular thought comes up and immediately it triggers the arising of a sense of identity to receive that thought and then judge it, prefer it, want to push it away, want to bring it closer, like it, not like it. And notice that that mecha mechanism happens so fast we don't even notice it. And it's all happening in front of consciousness. That thought arises, Another thought arises that receives it, interprets it, gives it memory. That second thought is the thought of identity. That is the belief in the person. And we're so convinced that it's who I am because it speaks in first person. It says, I don't like that. And so now all the power and authority of the real I, which is consciousness, gets projected on this thought simply because the thought said the word I. You following that? Experience happens and the conditioned response arises to receive the experience. That conditioned response is the identity. That's how it works. When you no longer believe that, you're free of it. But it takes a bit of it takes a bit of doing. <laughs> Are you following that? It's like it's like really significant. Okay? It, it's it's actually how it works. See, while most people are thinking, oh, I got to do something so that I create a different experience, but the experience isn't the problem. There's no suffering in experience. The suffering is here because that which arises to resist or accept it creates the suffering. That's the false sense of I. That's the separate self. That's the thing we learned to do when we were very, very little. When we, this idea took root that I am not, that I am separate, that I am this body, 
that I'm in this big universe, that this universe is not on my side, more or less antagonistic towards me or benevolent, depending on you know the quality of the experience that I have. And in either case, it's all wrong. Is that clear for everybody? And all this, this happens all the time. Yes. <laughs> and that this happens all the time. Yes. That's exa- and I think I explained that's why. That's how it works. The sense of me always comes after. We think it's, oh, I'm having the experience. But the experience happens. Then the sense of me that wants to take credit for it. <laughs> right? And it's all happening in front of consciousness. The real experiencer is consciousness. Example I like, like, like to use that thing that runs up, <laughs> that hops up. Says, I'm having the experience is like the clown in the circus, the trapeze guy is doing death defying feet. You know, the audience starts to cheer and the clowns run out and take the bow. <laughs> That's the mind that is, that is the egoic mind. That is the sense of a person, which is nothing other than a, uh, a conditioned response of the nervous system to a particular experience. That's all there is to it. It's, it's flimsy. It's a ghost. It's, there's nothing really there. Okay. Andrew says, thank you, G. Thank you. Uh, Ankush, did I say that correct, Misra? Where are you? I want to know where you are. Uh, what is the difference between self-awareness and consciousness? If they're the same, how do we know for sure that it's not just a function of our brain? Um, I talked a bit about that in the beginning. Um, and, and Kush, if you weren't here, I'm not sure if you were, because um, I talked about the science of consciousness and I took up that question, um, uh, I- I- exactly that question. There's no real difference between self-awareness and consciousness. I use the words interchangeably. Sometimes I'll use them a little bit more uh, specifically. But what I'm referring to is whatever it is that's hearing my words. Whatever it is in you that's actually where the experiencing is being registered must be you. And to probe into that, to see if that consciousness can be nothing but a functioning of the brain. And if it is, what does that mean? It means it's not conscious at all because the brain is just a bunch of parts functioning. There is no consciousness then. It's only a temporary experience that is going to collapse. But there is a qualitative difference about consciousness. Is there not? There's something about it. If nothing else, it's always the same. What is you're conscious of is always changing, but the consciousness, the experiencing itself, the knowing itself, look at your entire life. Has it ever changed? Has the knowing ever changed, even though what's known is changed constantly? Now, there's nothing in the universe that functions like that. There's no particle anywhere that functions changelessly. There is something qualitatively different about consciousness that is unmistakable. And I just urge everyone to probe that because if that's the case, then the laws of physics and anatomy and biology, the entire structure of classical analysis upon which modern science and the Western world is based does not apply. (laughs) We need a completely different science of consciousness. So that's the short answer of what I said uh, at the beginning. If you want to go back for the, to the beginning and, uh, uh, and watch the, uh, the full-blown version, that's kind of what I said in a nutshell. Um, so thank you for that. And I still want to know where you, where you are, Ankush. Ankush Mizra, lovely name. Um, Sophie answered you. Kyle said, thank you. Andre said, hi again. <laughs> hi again. Um, Let's see. Barbara says, yes, clear. Great examples. Good, good. Sarah says, what does interaction, well, does interaction with other being become less taxing? Well, sure. If there's no story, it's the story that makes it taxing. Not the other being. You know, the the person that arises to receive the other, the whatever's happened, whatever the experience is, is interpreting the experience. The sense of a person means, ah, 
This is who I am. This is what this means, right? Now, it doesn't mean that, right? It doesn't mean anything outside of your conscious. Nothing has inherent meaning, right? If, if something, if, if the object we're looking at had intrinsic meaning, everybody would see the same thing. But we don't. Somebody says, God, that's the most beautiful, stunning painting I've ever seen. It just inspires me. Somebody else is going, what? What the hell's that? I could have done that. Same painting. What's different? Uh, the, the eyes through which, it, which it's being seen. So experience is completely subjective. So my approach is to, is to let's make the subject of objective. Let's make our own subjectivity the object of our exploration and not look for an objective truth where obviously you can't find one. Why do I see this in the way that I do? What is it? And I could have had a very different upbringing and I would have seen it completely differently, which means that it's arbitrary. None of this is true. None of this is permanent. None of this is changeless. Therefore, it's not me. It's part of experience. It's not what's having the experience. And I can take it and I, and I just, just start looking at it very closely. And then you can begin to see that something happens and a series of reactions within the nervous system take place in response to the event that takes place in the environment. They begin to cascade and you'll see at the root of all of them is a sense of I. Is a, is a small sense of I. Oh, this happened. Oh, what does that mean to me? It means nothing to consciousness. Consciousness is just pure experience. Right? Pure, clean, untouched, unpreferential experience. No agenda, no nothing. It is just the sheer act of being aware that something happened. All reaction to what happened is therefore taking place as a result of conditioning happening in front of this lens of consciousness. But that reaction is where all the suffering is. That's where the false sense of identity is. And that is where you find awakening. That reactive pattern doesn't awaken, does it? Consciousness awakens, realizes I'm not that. I'm witnessing that. How can I possibly be that? I, I'm looking at this. I can't be that. <laughs> This is much more subtle and internal, but it's the same thing. I'm witnessing this entire phenomena taking place. I didn't even realize it was taking place. It was happening so fast. I was so identified. I didn't even know it was happening. I thought that was me. Now I'm looking at this. Something happens. There's a reaction. I'm looking at the reaction. Holy crap. <laughs> I'm seeing it. Well, then who am I? Who is it that's looking at this? And is, th is that which is looking at that, is that reacting? Even all the reactive patterns are happening on the other side of the lens. What's on this side of the lens that's seeing it? <clears throat> Kyle says, thank you. Hi again. Yes, clear. Well, does interaction with, oh, the God, I think I covered that. Andre said, the word meaning doesn't have an intrinsic meaning. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's whatever you say it is. It's whatever you say it is. And then, but, but the nature of the egoic mind is that when it, it, it draws a conclusion, make sure it's not rubbing me, it believes it to be true. It's, oh, that's the meaning it has. She's really a nasty person. So she becomes a nasty person. And we don't realize that we have just projected all of that on, on some action triggered something in us that we associate that action with nasty person. We then project it all back on her and say, she's a nasty person. The entire thing's happening right here. <laughs> the entire thing is happening right on the back of your eyeballs. Alessandra says, hello. Hello, Alessandra. Good to see you. Sarah says, I gotcha. Thanks so much, G. Thank you, Sarah. Popey says, when I realize that I'm not my past, my mistakes, traumas, and my body, I instantly feel better. Why is that? Because the burden of the bullshit is off your shoulders. 
we are burdened by this belief that we are stuck in the past by the mistakes, by traumas, by the body. And when we, when we realize we are, what happens? How do you think a whale would feel if you took it out? Of, you know, it's been stuck in a swimming pool, right? It's been swimming in the oceans, having a good time. Suddenly you stuck it in the swimming pool and people are showing it and you're feeding it fish and then you're making it jump, right? And then all of a sudden somebody says, we got it, we stopped doing this and it gets put back into the ocean and suddenly it's like, ah, oh, ah, oh. What, it, what do you think it will, that whale is going to feel like? That's what you're feeling. Consciousness, which has been confined artificially within the idea that I'm my past, my memories, I'm this body, I'm this, you know, this person, I'm these reactions, I'm this condition pattern, and it has been taken out of it. It's like, oh, oh my God, I'm the universe. I can breathe. Of course, that's why it feels better. Instantly. Because it's it's gone. The nonsense is gone. So how are we doing on time here? 217. I'm, I'm good. Have we got any more questions? Anybody else want to um, ask something? I'm here as long as you need. I think I've got covered them all. I've done pretty good at keeping up. And not being too lengthy, Monica says, I'm reading Beyond Biocentrism from Robert Lanza, MD. Have you read a GP? I have not. Very interesting. I highly recommend it. Thank you for your, for your guide. Ah, very well, you're welcome. I will check it out. Beyond Biocentrism. Ah, it's, it's a great title. Yeah, so now thinking of ourselves as, well, consciousness is... The consciousness that is the mosquito is the same consciousness that is a human. I mean, if take you consciousness and and identify, get put, put yourself in a mosquito body and identify with it. You'll have mosquito feelings, mosquito drives, mosquito interests, <laughs> right? And if unless you understand consciousness, that's who you'll think you are. Till it gets liberated, saying, so "Oh, I'm not that." Um, Monica says, again, Dr. Lance is providing a compelling argument for consciousness as the basis for the universe, rather than consciousness simply being its byproduct. It, it, it's going to happen. It's, it's going to happen. And I'm, I'm actually seeing, I, I, I'm seeing um, the symptoms of, of that. More and more scientists have realized we've hit the end of classical analysis. It cannot explain so much of the phenomena. It cannot, it, the, the only way it can do it, it has to deny it. It has to push it away. It has to say it didn't really happen. It has to you know, call it a placebo or call it a, uh, you know, call it some kind of a delusion. Uh, but we're, we are seeing the end, the, dis, the, the disillusion of the materialistic model of the universe. We're witnessing it firsthand. That is going along with all of the other structures of, of humanity and political and religious and social, all of everything is collapsing because the material model itself is collapsing. This is what Christ meant by the end of the world. That's what he was referring to. He's not referring to a big war. He was referring to this, the end of the materialistic model of the, uh, of, of the universe. And uh, he even said, talking about, he, he would, he used the example of the temple in Jerusalem, but what he was actually talking about was the entire structure of human thought. He said, there's not one stone set upon another that shall not be torn down. That's what he was talking about. The entire model of, ma of matter as the source and substance and constructor of the universe is on its way out. What I'm telling you now about consciousness is going to be the understanding over uh, with, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years. Yeah, this is what's happening. Um, da, 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 da. Thumbs up and a heart for Monica. Thank you. Am I getting really... Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm getting kind of... Uh, 
I hope my voice is clear because I think I'm getting a little choppy on the video. I'm not sure why, but Andre says, LOL, words are meaningless, but we operate all the time processing the meaning of the words. Yeah. Which is why uh, I, I like it when I get a question is that what's the difference between self-awareness and consciousness? Um, and you will oftentimes see me say, okay, when I use this word, this is what I mean. So we can try to get on the same page because words are like that. <laughs> words are charged, right? Words have all sorts of meaning and association. I, I mean, you can say something to somebody and they go off because a single word, because it has, it's so charged with meaning and they think, and then they project that meaning on you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see, Sophie, please say something about being innocent at core. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, that's a great place to end. So I just want to say this one more thing to Andre. I love the idea of chronocentrism in, in Lanza's work. Uh, uh, beautiful. I, I have to become familiar with that. Very, very useful. Please say something about being innocent at core. Well, for those of you who know my story, um, and, if, and if not, you'll have to go through, inner, through up to inner reconciliation level two to hear it, because that's the only place. Well, I've, I've said it on, uh, on various kinds of, when I'm interviewed, and a long enough interview, and they want me to go into my story, I, I tell it. But it was this recognition of this innocent core that saved my life. And it was brought home to me so clearly that it never left me at 19 years old, which was 47 years ago. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, 47 years ago. And to, the dis to this day, I can't tell the story without breaking into tears, you know, without getting all choked up. And I always have to stop um, because it was, you know, it was that or death, you know, and, uh, and so something kind of intervened and what inter intervened it's what i call original innocence <laughs> my son has a dog original innocence yeah. not the least bit concerned about about the radio or the or the, or the tv um <laughs> so when I'm talking about this place, when I'm talking about, um, <laughs> it's okay, she'll be quiet soon. Got to guard the house, right? A lot of nasties coming by. Pure innocence, just expressing whatever's there. No editing, nothing in front of it, nothing getting in the way, no filters, no buffers, nothing. Just pure, just pure expression of who you are. When I bring you back to that place of pure consciousness, you know, I, so something happens in the environment, a reaction takes place within us, it grabs a hold of it, that creates the sense of identity of the person. That person has preferences, they have likes and dislikes, they, re, you know, they can be nasty, they can be nice, right? All sorts of different stuff. But when you see from the place, from behind the lens that's perceiving that, that consciousness that I keep referring to is pure innocence. It is not, it's not an abstraction. It's not consciousness is just, I don't care about it. It's pure love. It is pure welcoming. It is not detached in the sense that it doesn't care. It's, it's unattached in the sense that it doesn't have a preference to try to force something to go in a particular way. It allows everything to be what it is. That's pure love. And that's pure innocence. And that is you. What is hearing my words, the consciousness that I call consciousness or self-awareness, that which is hearing my words is innocence itself. What's hearing my words is pure love. It is divine love. It is love with a capital L. It is the essence of all being. So it isn't, you know, we, we use the word consciousness. I'm so glad you, you, you brought this up, Sophie, because we use that word consciousness and it can seem kind of abstract. It can seem more like, you know, mind and investigated and experience, pure experiencing. 
But if you're really going to fully experience a awakening, it it's not just consciousness, knowing and being, it's also Ananda. It's also the bliss. But that bliss is not the ups and downs of happiness, of human happiness, which continue, by the way, and get and get better. It is the it is the pure bliss of not of total non-resistance. Everything is okay the way it is. Everything is allowed. Everything is welcome. Everything is love. It is the infinite heart. It is the divine heart. It is the, it is the very heart of God. That, that, is, that is what is meant by God is love in the, in the, uh, in the New Testament. God is love. That consciousness is love. And pure innocence. That's what you are. That came to me, and I experienced that long before I had any understanding of consciousness and all of, all of the stuff I've been talking about. Because all of that stuff points you in the direction, but when you feel it, you know it is love. And I needed that to save my sorry ass, all the talk about consciousness and stuff, which I had, was familiar with. I knew that, that stuff meant nothing until my heart had just been opened, which it continues to be open. And I seek ways in which to continue to open, to become increasingly less resistant, to welcome more and more and more, to find those places that are still saying this, right? That are still, you know, criticizing somebody or condemning somebody or judging somebody. And, you know, fortunately, there's not as many of those, but they pop up, a place where I've taken a position and I abandon that position. Not so that I'm not, so that I'm, you know, better, a better person, but because it's love. Love doesn't have a position. Love is total openness itself. So thank you for asking that, uh, uh, Sophie. Remington, how do I have the final awakening that ends all suffering for everyone and everyone becomes awakening? <laughs> Don't worry about that yet, buddy. <laughs> Let the eye return home. Just follow what I'm saying. Just follow the pointings. Let the eye return home. And then you'll see. You, you won't need to ask the question. Don't put the cart be before the horse. Don't try to get into college before you finish grade school. Right? Know who you come to know who you are and feel it with all your heart. And then you won't need to worry about that. And Kush says, thank you, GM from India, currently residing in Canada, ah, make me think if our experience of hearing has changed in all these years, and yet we agree that hearing is a function of brain. Well, I don't agree that hearing is a function of brain. <laughs> I, there are elements that move stuff around and electrons get excited and stuff like that, but I don't, uh, I don't see that as what's hearing. I don't see anything in there that can actually hear. So that's, if you've already discussed it, I'm happy to refer to it and, and ponder. Yeah, it's right at, right at the beginning. I, don't, I can't go into it again uh, now. Uh, but uh, where in Canada are you? Because I'm going to be doing a live retreat at the end of July. If anybody's interested in that, by the way, uh, I'm going to be doing a three-day retreat at the Krishnamurti uh, Center of Canada in, uh, uh, British, in Victoria, British Columbia. If anybody would like to, uh, very inexpensive, um, I'm basically volunteering and it's a nonprofit. So um, just go to gpwalsh.com slash retreat and it'll take you to the place where you can, to the Krishnamurti site where you can, uh, you can register. Uh, Pam says, thanks again, GP, got to go, namaste, thank you. Pam, Chrissy, that is the utter joy of being with my two young grandsons, pure innocence, openness, allowing. It's brought me so much these past months. Thank you, G. Yeah, children are in innocent. Doesn't mean they're always nice, right? But they are innocent. They're pure. They're themselves. <laughs> I'm, I'm at my son's house now with my granddaughter. You can just watch the, you know, the emotions go past, you know, they don't stick, they don't cling, there's no pretension. She is absolutely exactly what she is. 
Um, she has not learned to edit yet, right? It'll happen, and then she'll get to wake up from it. <laughs> we have to all go, I have to all go through it. Um, Kyle says, I find it hard to relate to anybody in my life while going through this realization. Um, that's okay. You can relate to me. Come join uh, the Facebook group. There's plenty of, 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 of people. Um, uh, uh, I don't know the exact uh, link to it. Maybe uh, somebody who's in the Facebook group can, can put it in there to, so you can show. If you've taken any of my classes, anything at all, um, even just the you know the seven dollar you know meditation or, a, or or five book thing, um, you can get into the, the uh, into the Facebook group and there's plenty of people there who uh, I'm I know you're going to be able to uh, uh, re relate to. Um, I feel I'm always worried about myself and I try to hide that from everyone. I want to open up, but how? It's okay. okay? When you're going through a, a major transformation, especially one that is the ultimate transformation, it's it isn't to be shared with everyone. Jesus even said, "You know, don't cast pearls before swine." Uh, it, it, it there's wisdom in that. Don't don't be quick to talk about it unless you know it's somebody that you can talk to, somebody that you can that knows what, that 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 gets you, which is why I've created the Facebook community, and I hope that community uh, will 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 grow because we need it we need a sangha right? the three treasures of buddhism are the buddha the dharma and the sangha right? we need it we need the community to uh, to support us because the world doesn't get it yet they will <laughs> um and there you can learn how to open up and then you'll learn how and when to open up to people um, who aren't on the same path. And you become very sensitive to it. And, and, and then at that point, it's also okay. You know, just have a mundane conversation with somebody. It's okay. You know, I have friends that I talk to that they have no idea what I do. <laughs> but, you know, enjoy each other's company and that's it. That, 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 that's all there is to it. And, uh, and uh, not many of those, you know, because but he does know what I do. But um, you know, I, I meet people all all the time in various in various walks of life, and uh, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy every last bit of it. So uh, uh, you learn how to open up and just get you know every moment will have juice for you. Joanna uh, from Chapala, Mexico. <laughs> Wonderful. Does this take a lot of effort? At first because we have to remember that we are, are that, but, but it, it doesn't take any effort to be who you are. It just, we're so used to thinking of ourselves as the person um, that it does take some effort to re keep reminding ourselves that we're not. And that effort, <clears throat> the effort becomes minimal the more curious and interested you are the more you're not just concerned about the results, the fruit of awakening, and are really fascinated by the process of awakening and what reality is and who am I really and what's the nature of consciousness. When these things thoroughly engage your, uh, your interest, it's not an effort, right? I mean, is it an effort? to think about your beloved, you fall in love, you know, you're really hot for somebody. Is it hard? Is it effort to think about them? The, the real problem is, is that our interests are, are, are divided. They're diffused, right? Because we're more interested in heaven than we are in God. We're more interested in the fruits of awakening than we are in the awakening itself. We want to get the result. How do I get the peace? How do I get the stillness? You awaken, right? Well, what does that mean? It means that I'm really, really interested in knowing who I am. Then it's effortless. It's not hard at all. Yeah. Monica says, thank you, G, and thank you all. It's late in Italy. I have to go to sleep. It was beautiful, profound, and precious. See you all next time with love. Thank you, Monica. Chrissy just put in the link for uh, the graduates on the Facebook group. You can go there and you can ask to join and uh, 
if you've taken any class or anything at all, uh, however small, you're, you're, you're welcome there. I do have to limit it to people who have taken what well, something from me so that it isn't just, you know, uh, you know, people, it's kind of, there's a, a minimal price of admission. Um, and Kush says, if you have to go, please ignore this. Isn't the word hearing and abstraction itself referring to the process of vibration, hitting the eardrums and some neurons, neurons going off in the brain? That's the way it's described materialistically. Absolutely. Um, so is there something or is there someone or something hearing the sound is hearing Hound is hearing just, or is hearing just happening? Well, that's the question. Is, you, you're aware of the sound, are you not? The nature of that awareness is the question. The nature of that awareness has been, to the materialistic model, model is your brain. I am saying it's not. And I am not the first one to say this. Sages have been saying it time and time and time and time again, and are encouraging you to look within. It is not a function of the brain. It is not a function of the body. What is actually hearing, that where it's registering, where the buck stops is consciousness and it is not the body. But this has to be discovered for yourself. This has to be discovered for yourself. You have to become interested enough Get get kind of hooked on this idea. Well, what if it isn't the brain? What if what G is saying is true and it's consciousness? You realize the implications of that are earth shattering because the entire structure of every interaction, every relationship, every society, everything that's happened in the in the in on the earth to human beings since we became civilized has been based on that assumption. If we see that it's not true everything changes. We are talking about uh, an epoch, an epoch shift. We are talking about a completely new age, aren't we? This is the level at which I want you to examine it because that's how important it is. Sophie says, thank you so much for love outpouring. Love you. Thank, thank you so much. I do love this. <laughs> this isn't, it isn't hard. Yeah. Barbara says, thank you, GP. See you in Victoria. See you, uh, see, you, see you, Barbara. All right. I think it's about time to bring this to close. It's time to uh, go uh, hang out with my son and granddaughter, and I'm going to go see my sister as well. So Judy says, thanks, G, and everyone for another awesome satsang. Um, well, thank you all. It's, uh, it's always such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, We'll do it again next week. And uh, the uh, link for the graduate group, um, the retreat, gpwalsh.com slash retreat. If you want to uh, come and hang out with me for three days live, um, it's going to be a very, very interesting. And this is what we're going to talk about. Um, it's called From Delusion to Awakening. And it's going to be this whole process of waking up and then integrating that awakening in, in, into your life. So thank you all. Love you.